Good morning, my friends on Facebook. I want to thank you for joining me for Tuesday morning Facebook Live. Our devotion today is going to be an interesting one. It's a little bit different than um, some of the typical ones that we've done. And I'm getting tons of text messages. You know, it's funny. I don't get any text messages before I start. As soon as I hit Facebook Live, they just start rolling in. Anyway, um, I am happy to be saying that we are talking today about something that's a little bit interesting from the Old Testament. And it was a recommendation from um, my friend Millie. Good morning, Diana and Pam. Thank you for joining me for our morning devotion. Hope you're ready. Hope you have your Bible open because we're going to be in the Old Testament. We're not going to flip around an awful lot. Good morning, Joe and Ron. And good to see you, my friend, uh, Janet Snell. Um, listen, my friends, um, not every devotion is one that I choose. However, this is a great story. And I remember reading it when, when it was um, requested that I do this. I couldn't remember the uh, particular verses in Isaiah. But then when I started reading it this morning and studying it online, looking at my commentaries, uh, good morning, I see your names there. I remembered the story. It's a very powerful story in which um, God does a miracle. So today we're going to be talking about a miracle. And um, it's not a miracle in Isaiah's life. It's a, it's a miracle in the life of one of his contemporaries. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool story. We've already got 16 people on here. Thank you for joining us, everybody. I see your names there. Hope you're doing well. And uh, listen, I have only one more Wednesday that I'm preaching in front of a camera because September 6th, we are opening up our church. We are really excited. We're going to have two services, one at 9 and the other at 1030. So we ask you to RSVP. Just call the church. Let us know which one you want to go to, 9 o'clock or 1030. And we would love for you to join us. The other thing is I'm hoping to have children's ministry up and running in October. Wouldn't it be great to dismiss the children to children's church like we used to do? And um, let them go and get their Bible lesson while we're in church. I think that'd be fantastic. So we're looking at October uh, doing that. And so a lot of good things are happening, my friends. Thank you so much for all that you're doing and all that you're you know, you're, uh, you're praying for our church. You're praying for those that have lost loved ones as part of our church. And you're growing in the Lord. So take this time right now through this pandemic to draw closer to the Lord, to spend more time in reading and praying as m many of us are spending more time at home than we would probably like to uh, spend at home. So uh, enjoy your families and make the most of it. Good morning, my friends. I see your names there. Even my brother, Matt. Good morning, Matt. Thank you for joining us. And Vicki. Well, we've got 20 on here already, so it's time for us to begin, my friends. We're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah chapter 38. I'm going to give you a minute to get over there. While you're flipping over to Isaiah chapter 38, I just want to remind you that today is Tuesday, which means we have prayer meeting tonight at 6 p.m. Um, now, I hope you join us. It's going to be wonderful. Um, we need your prayer requests. There's a lot of people in our church who need prayer. And this is a chance. Good morning, Barbara. Good to see you. This is a chance for you to just be honest and transparent about what's going on in your life or the lives of your friends and family members and neighbors, whatever. Um, you don't have to give last names. You can be as anonymous. And even some prayer requests are unspoken. Uh, but we know there's heavy things on all of us that need prayer. And we don't need to know the details because God already does. And so it's a chance for us just to get together and to pray. We don't have to be present physically to be present in spirit. Amen? And so it's a wonderful time for us to do that. Now, yes, Isaiah 38. Thank you so much, Sheila. This is a little bit interesting in that it's a miracle, um, but it's not a miracle like other miracles. And so let's read the passage of Scripture, and then I'm going to try to break it down. So we're starting with verse 1 of Isaiah 38. And was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, Your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully. 
and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah again. Go and tell Hezekiah, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. Verse 7. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back ten steps. It has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back ten steps. It had gone down. All right, so we're going to stop there. Um, that's basically our passage for this morning, guys. It's a wonderful miracle, but uh, not only uh, there's two. There's actually two miracles that are happening. Uh, so those are verses um, one through seven, uh, one through eight. Thank you, Sheila, of uh, Isaiah thirty-eight. So there's a few things that we know about Hezekiah that I'm going to be just sharing with you. It's a little bit academic, so just bear with me, and then I'm going to sum it up and, um, and, and wrap it up for us. But there's two miracles. Obviously, the first miracle is the healing of Hezekiah because he was literally on his deathbed. And the second one was the shadow when the Lord took the sun and pulled it back. So we're going to be breaking that down a little bit to you today. It's a kind of academic because I had to do a lot of research. Uh, Millie called it science, and I guess you can call it science. Um, a lot of the, um, the commentators that I read this morning had different viewpoints about this, and so I want to give you a couple different viewpoints. Now, first, let's talk about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a son of a godless father. His name was Ahaz. Now, Ahaz was a king as well as Hezekiah. And we find the story of Ahaz in 2 Kings 16, 2 through 4. Uh, he was very evil. Yet we are told that Hezekiah did right in the eyes of the Lord. He was a good king. This is a pattern we see again and again. Men and women forsaking the model they saw in their home and turning to God. Obviously, Hezekiah decided, I'm not going to be like my father. I'm going to be a good man of God, a great man of God. Hezekiah became king in 716 B.C. and reigned uh, until 687 or 86 B.C. So again, those numbers are going down because we are going from B.C. to A.D. So they got to go down before they go up. Does that make sense to you? Please don't be confused by that. That's not a big deal. He immediately removed Hezekiah immediately removed and destroyed the false religious worship in Israel and restored the temple worship, the sacrifices, and the Levitical and priestly ministries and Passover. Now, this is great. What he's doing is he is bringing revival to the church. And we find this in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 1 through 33. We're not going to read that today because we're kind of focusing on the miracles more or less. Okay, not just Hezekiah's wonderful life, but later in his life, Hezekiah was ill. Now, he had gotten boils, they say, or inflammation, infl inflammation over his body, uh, which Isaiah initially thought would be fatal. He thought it would be fatal because the Lord told him it would be fatal. So sometimes um, the Lord does change his mind. But he's not surprised by the times that he changes his mind. It just means that he is a compassionate God. He is a very kind father. And I'm not saying that we can change his mind. He knows he's going to do it before he does it. But he takes mercy on those he takes mercy. And Hezekiah is a man that the Lord took mercy upon. Now, the narrative of the sickness and miraculous recovery is found in 2 Kings 21. We're not going to get to that either. 2 Chronicles 32.24. We're not going to get to that either. But in Isaiah 38, 1, we did read. So we read uh, Isaiah 38, 1. Now, various ambassadors came to congratulate him on his recovery. So this was well known and well documented, documented that their king was going to die. In fact, the Lord said he would die. 
And Hezekiah just prayed. He prayed a wonderful prayer. And uh, um, you know what? When, when we are sick and, and others are sick, uh, the Bible says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And the prayers of a righteous woman availeth much. I, I, I like that. It doesn't say that the prayers availeth much. But the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective, depending on which translation you're looking at. Now, according to Isaiah 38, 5, like we read, Isaiah, uh, Hezekiah, sorry, lived another 15 years after praying to God. His son and successor, Manasseh, was born during this time. He was 12 years of age when he succeeded Hezekiah. The interesting thing is... Um, if you put the math together, uh, his son, Manasseh, was born during the time of his 15 years of extended life. So it's understood that Hezekiah didn't have any children to succeed his throne. And so the Lord prolonged his years and then allowed him to be a father of Manasseh. Um, now, there's reasons why some commentaries share uh, that Hezekiah got sick. We're not going to talk in great detail about that. Um, but nevertheless, Hezekiah refused to marry and have children, although in the end, he married Isaiah's daughter, Isaiah the great prophet. So the king married the great prophet's daughter, okay? Um, and I like that. And then she gave birth to a son, and his name was Manasseh. Let's look at verse 7, because most of our passage uh, that we're going to be studying today has to do with verse 7 and 8. So let me just read verse 7 and 8 from Isaiah 38. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps. It has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps that it had gone down. Now, this is a beautiful piece of scripture, quite honestly. Good morning, Laura. It's a beautiful piece of scripture because God is showing signs of miracles. And you know what? In the Old Testament, he doesn't mind saying, I will show you a sign that I will do this. Remember, it was the Pharisees in the New Testament who came to Jesus and often said, show us a sign that will prove to us that you have the authority to do these things. And Jesus says, only an adulterous generation asks for a sign. Now here, Hezekiah is not asking for a sign, but there are good people in the Old Testament that ask for a sign. The truth is Jesus said what he said because in the New Testament, there were many signs, miracles, and wonders that were already being done. So for those that came in arrogance, typically the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, the teachers and the leaders, they, they wanted a sign. Show us a sign as if they're saying to him, you are insubordinate to us. You are under our authority. So therefore, we're asking you to give us a sign at our demand right now. And Jesus doesn't answer to that. Jesus doesn't answer to them because he is the incarnate God. He is the son of God. He speaks the words of God. He doesn't need to give them a sign. He doesn't answer to their becking call. Amen? But Hezekiah in the Old Testament doesn't ask for a sign. He just asks for prolonged life. But God said, I will give you a sign nevertheless. And this will be a sign. Now, the offer reminds us that of Ahaz. Again, Ahaz is his father who was evil. But it was received in a far different spirit. So if you wanted to look at 2 Kings chapter 20, the story is more fully told. Hezekiah asked for a sign in that particular verse and has offered his choice. So if you look back at 2 Kings 20, basically the shadow can go forward or back. In Isaiah, he doesn't ask for a sign. So with something like a childlike simplicity, he chooses the latter. Why? Because it was more difficult of the two for the sun to go back than for the sun shadow to go forward. Okay? They measured the sun based on the steps. You can take a look at Stonehenge and some of the, 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 the understandings of Stonehenge, okay, have to do with a sundial, right? 
So here they are using a sundial based on the steps. So if it was on the third step, it might be three in the afternoon. If it was on the second step, it may be uh, four in the afternoon. I don't know. I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not really sure. But if, in fact, um, uh, it, it, Hezekiah does ask for a sign in 2 Kings 20, and I didn't read it, but it, it says that he asked for a sign, and he asked for it to go backward because it was more difficult of the two. The sundial um, by Ahaz, probably, like the altar, uh, that was part of the Syrian and Assyrian art. This is something that they really practiced to understand the, the, you know, the signs of the times or even the time of the day, okay? So they would use this as a clock, so to speak. You know, the sun comes up at a certain time and it sets at a certain time. And so they use this uh, to understand time when they needed to get ready to clean up their tools. It was going to be, you know, lunchtime or when it was going to be time for dinner and that kind of thing. So um, casting of a shadow was so to indicate the time, each step representing an hour or a half of an hour, probably an hour. The nature of the phenomenon seems to be curiously limited as that of the darkness of the crucifixion. So we're seeing some interesting things. God has the ability, my friends, to stop time. God has the ability, my friends, to hide the sun. He did it in other pieces of scripture too. He does it for Hezekiah. There was no prolongation of the day in the rest of Palestine or Jerusalem for the backward movement was limited to the step dial. When Jesus was on the cross, okay, for those hours, you could say the sun, the sun stood still, and it did stand still for other people, but what happened when Jesus gave up his spirit? Yes, the temple was torn in two. Yes, there were earthquakes, but also there was darkness over the whole land. So what happened to the sun? Now, an offer here was made of a sign of a particular kind, uh, and it was offered under peculiar conditions. We learn from 2 Kings that a choice was submitted to him. He was determined whether time, as measured by a certain timepiece or clock, which was known as the dial of Ahaz, his father, should make a sudden leap forward, that is the shadow leaping forward, advancing 10 degrees upon the dial, or whether it should retire backwards, the shadow upon the same dial, receding 10 degrees. Now, Hezekiah determined the latter so that it would go backwards. That was just his decision, and he decided that for himself. So time was rolled backwards, or at any rate, appeared to be rolled backwards. And the king, seeing so great a miracle, which king? Uh, I'm talking about King Hezekiah still. He saw such a great miracle that he accepted it without hesitation. And the Lord healed him. Okay, that's verse 7. Now, if we look at verse 8, and we understand the sundial of Ahaz, we are informed... Um, that the sundial was an invention by someone else. So Ahaz just kind of incorporated that into his culture. It may have been by the Babylonians, uh, and it probably passed through the Assyrians, as I mentioned earlier. But Ahaz may have obtained a, a, a knowledge of it, and so therefore, when the Lord asked him, he chose the latter, let the sun go back. And probably as he was sick, laying in his bed, he was able to see the steps. Okay? We're looking at Isaiah 38, verses 1 through 8. All right? Now, um, there is some science in this. But quite honestly, Millie, there's a lot of science that cannot work in our mindset. We don't know exactly how this works. But let me read this to you. Behold, I will turn the shadow of the steps which the sun has gone down on the steps of Ahaz backwards 10 steps. 10 steps. That may be 10 hours. Or if you look at each step as a half an hour, it could be five hours. And the sun turned back 10 steps on the steps which it had gone down. 
we must suppose that the steps, whatever they were, could be seen from the sick chamber of Hezekiah, to whose mind the sign had an oblivious symbolic significance. Oblivious to others, maybe, but not to him. The retreating shadow miraculously lengthened the day, maybe by five hours or ten hours, was a pledge of the postponement of that night in which no man can work, which had almost overtaken him. Okay? It is not clear, indeed, that a regularly constructed sundial of any kind is meant to do something like this, but only God himself can do this. How the effect was produced, we don't know. I'm going to... I'm going to tell you the science is not there. It's very difficult for me to, 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 to break this down as I'm reading different commentaries from, from Matthew Henry to Barnes Notes to the pulpit commentary. I mean, some weighty commentaries. I'm reading to you my research, my friends. Uh, there, there must have been some sort of an eclipse as argued by uh, one scholar, you know, a refraction or by an actual alteration of the earth's motion. It's possible that God slowed the earth down because we know that the earth moves and pivots and that's why we get the sunshine and we get the moon. Whatever it was, was local, not general. Since the king of Babylon subsequently sent ambassadors to, to inquire concerning the wonder that was done in the land, the sun returned 10 degrees, we must not press this expression as indicating a real alteration of the sun's place. I don't believe God moved the sun. I don't believe God moved the heavens. The meaning is that the shadow cast by the sun returned or went backwards. It returned or went backwards. But I don't believe that God moved the sun Maybe he moved the earth. And we're going to be closing with this. Maybe what ha is happening is God is showing this great man of God, Hezekiah, and telling him that he is going to be given 15 years of life. He's going to be given a wife, a child that he'll name uh, Manasseh, and uh, will, <clears throat> will be a man of God. But nevertheless... Thank you for liking my shirt. It is different, isn't it? But nevertheless, the important thing is God listens to our prayers, my friends. What I do know is that Hezekiah is on his deathbed, probably with boils. He's inflamed with sores. And the great prophet Isaiah, a major prophet, comes to him and says, God says you're going to die. In the prime of your life, you're going to die. And he said, uh-uh, I'm going to plead to the Lord to spare my life. I'll tell you what, when a, when, a, when, a, when a prophet like Isaiah comes to you and says something, you can take it to the bank, my friends. But listen to me, you do not have to accept calamity. You do not have to accept bad news without hope. There are countless times in Scripture that we can use, my friends, in which we can plead our case to the Lord and we can ask God for reversal. We can ask God for a miracle sign and wonder. And then sometimes God gives us a sign to prove to us that he will do what he says he will do. My friends, we serve a mighty God. We are limited. I understand that. We are flesh and bone. I understand that. We are not the brightest. I understand that. But we have faith. And the Bible says if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we can tell this mountain to be thrown into the depths of the sea and it'll do it. And the mountains are not always literal. The mountains are the problems in our lives. My friends, what is the problem in your life? Because if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to be thrown into the depths of the sea and it'll do it. If you believe. My friends, we have not because we ask not. 
let us go forward in great faith and understanding that God wants to answer our prayers as they align with his will. God was not done with Hezekiah. And God, in his infinite wisdom, knew that Hezekiah was going to pray this prayer, cry these tears, and beg God to prolong his life. And God did what God did. He is sovereign. He is God. To the glory of God, hallelujah. But I want you to remind you that you are a child of God. So do not be afraid to go to God and ask him what you want. If you need a healing, you need to pray and ask the people of your church to lay hands on you, the elders, to pray over you for a healing. If they don't believe in healing, you need to find a new church. Now, I'm not saying a healing will come just because you exercise your faith. We are under the sovereignty of God. God could have said to Hezekiah, no, you will surely die. I've heard your prayer, I've seen your, I've seen your tears, I've witnessed all this, but you will die, but God did not say that. He is God, he is not controlled by our prayers and our whims, my friends, but it doesn't hurt to ask and ask again. So I continue to enter into the throne room of God and make my request known for my children, for my friends, for my church, and for my family. My friends, we need to pray the mighty big prayers. We need to pray things that people have stopped praying long ago. We need to start praying for revival because God wants to bring revival to us. My friends, I love you, but don't stop praying. Don't stop believing that God wants to do miracle signs and wonders even now in our midst. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for this time together this morning. I thank you for the story of Hezekiah, a good man of God. Who, whose life was prolonged by 15 years and was shown, God, by a sign that you would do what you said you would do. Father, we come before you because we are a needy people this morning. We need you desperately. We want to be in your presence. We want to practice your presence. We want to spend uh, time in your word and in prayer and seeking your face, knowing your heart. We want to have the characteristics of Jesus. Father, I pray that we would not stop praying, that we would not stop believing, God, that you are going to bring revival to this land, that you are going to raise up for us an evangelist, <clears throat> or maybe several. Not prosperity preachers, Lord. God, we've had enough of that. We want somebody like Billy Graham. We want somebody with great integrity, or maybe it'll be a team of people, I don't know. But Father, somebody to lead this country back to our Christian roots, back to the word of God, and that we would see revival sweep through our land. Let us not stop praying for this, Lord. We also lift up those who are hurting today, those that have lost loved ones, so many within our congregation, Jesus. Oh, our hearts go out to them, Jesus. We love you and we praise you. We thank you, God, for reminding us that you love the prayers of your people and that the powerful prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Let us pray those prayers. Make way for the man of God. We come with fervent prayers. Make way for the woman of God. We come with fervent prayers. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. We lift you high. We sing your songs. We, we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. I love you guys. Thank you for joining me. We actually almost hit 30 again today. We're at 26 at this point. I hope you guys have a great day. 6 p.m. on my Facebook page. Bring your prayer requests. Let us lift up those prayer requests and serve a God who wants to answer prayer. I love you guys. Have a wonderful day.